Are you a businesswoman who is finding it challenging to get your ideas across and make a point? Welcome to Speakers Who Get Results with Elizabeth Bachman, a podcast dedicated to helping women get the visibility they want, whether making a speech or talking in a meeting. Every week, get valuable lessons from Elizabeth or learn from her roundtable conversations with experts and speakers on how to make a difference, not just a point. On to the show with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. Hello, and welcome to Speakers Who Get Results. I'm Elizabeth Bachman, your host, and this is the podcast where we discuss leadership, communication, presentation skills, and international business. My guest today is Fiona Liebehens, who is um, originally speaks German, but is was kind enough to do a conversation in English. And uh, But before I get to that, I'd like to invite you to see where your presentation skills are strong by taking our free four-minute quiz at speakforresultsquiz.com. That's www.speakforresultsquiz.com. And that's where you can see where your presentation skills are strong and where perhaps a little bit of support could get you the recognition you deserve and the results that you need. My guest today is Fiona Liebehens, and uh, she works for Bosch, uh, based in Stuttgart, Germany. And her motto is, if you dream it, you can do it, from Disney. She's an entrepreneurial and passionate consumer goods and technology leader, who has always been motivated to actively shape the future and make a difference. Nowadays, she's been in consumer goods and technology for over 16 years, and she's been on the manufacturing and retail side, also with leadership responsibility in general management, strategy, purchasing, marketing, and sales. Her enthusiasm for strategy, for holistic thinking of the sales and marketing function and innovation sparked off early. She also has been early interested in the issues of digitalization, artificial intel intelligence, and e-commerce. Holistic for Fiona means that the, her impact on society and the environment is also considered and that one's own engine is running to get a little better every day. Her motto is, if you can dream it, you can do it. And it's always with the goal of creating progress that creates value and meaning and for which diversity and people are an essential factor. In addition, it's not in her official bio, but Fiona Liebehens is a drummer. She's been playing the drums for uh, many years and she recently did a speech about how playing the drums connects to business. And wait till you hear it till she tells you what the symbol is for. On to the conversation with Fiona Liebehens. Fiona Liebehens, welcome and welcome to Speakers Who Get Results. Yeah, great to be here, Elizabeth. Well, I'm delighted to have you, and I have lots of questions because you have such an interesting background. Before I start, though, let me ask you, who would be your dream interview? If you could interview somebody that you wouldn't normally be able to reach, who would it be? What would you ask them? And who should be listening? It's a very tough question because there are actually quite some I would love to interview. But one would be Indra Noi, who was the Pepsi CEO and now serves on several supervisory boards. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask her about three key learnings uh, throughout her uh -huh. career and what now her vision is for the future, what she still has on her mind, what keeps her going to get up every day to learn a bit more about her motivation and her drivers. And I think that's interesting for basically everybody who is in business and wants to learn from such a like great mm -hmm. model who worked her way through from India to one of the largest American corporations, which yes. is 
a very inspiring story from my perspective. Yeah, well, and who should be listening? Well, I think everybody who is listening now uh, could be yes. listening, could be interesting for them. But I think it's like interesting for every female leader, mm -hmm. for everybody who wants to also strive in another environment, in another culture. But I think also in general for business leaders in today's global world where it's so much about developing good skills to mm -hmm. also adapt uh, to new environments, what I think she did in a very good way. Yes, yes, indeed. I also think um, when you do this, I'm going to be in the audience, absolutely. And let's invite young leaders, rising leaders, because mm -hmm. That's always useful to see, for those who aren't there yet, to see what mm. the possibilities are. Mm -hmm. you know, I used to say that, you know, you owe it to, if you, if you step forward and claim your place, claim your power, it's good for the organization mm -hmm. and it's good for the, for the young women who follow you. But more and more, I think you, it's also good for the young men mm -hmm. to see a powerful woman to the point where it stops being unusual. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah. Agree. I remember when I was growing up, they were still talking about lady drivers. You know, and when when I was growing up, as a I am considerably older than you are, but there was it was always sort of women driving was uh, the men couldn't believe that the women knew how to drive. And the women that the women could drive without doing something crazy or stupid or so forth. And mm -hmm. you see, you hear the same thing now. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with the same words, even it's just, you know, whatever they're doing that, that men thought were there, were just their prerogative. Mm -hmm. is the new thing. So, <laughs> I probably have to do a broadcast about that at some point, but oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So Fiona, one of the reasons I really wanted to talk to you is because we are in such a global world as a mm -hmm. the global business world. And you have worked in companies, you've worked in British Dutch companies, you've worked in American companies, German companies. And now you're in one of the old established German companies with a long history in manufacturing and technology. So what is it like to step forward as a female leader in a German-based company? Yeah, very good question. And indeed, one um, I get very often to compare also the different environments and how it is like to act and interact in these different cultures. And before like, I come straight to your question, might be like just for context for everybody who has explored might be like just one company culture so far. My experience is that the like original culture of the organization always plays like a little role. So um, even if it would be nice that in a global organization, it would be a global culture experience shows that it always like connected to the country's original culture. Mm -hmm. And especially in a German culture, still, I would say a bit more from a hierarchy standpoint, structured in a more traditional way. Um, what that means is that it's also a bit more political than in an American or British Dutch culture. They usually, it's faster about performance, about driving topics forward without mm -hmm. losing too much time for internal discussions. That means working in a German culture needs very good awareness uh, to analyze the connections between the people, between the departments, to understand also how to position oneself, to position topics, and then also strive in this environment. For me, it's um, a little bit being on a playground uh, where you have a more kind of labyrinth you have to navigate through. Labyrinth, like, yes, mm -hmm. right. A maze, yes. Exactly. And in the other cultures, it was a bit more, yeah, informal, relaxed, fast when I compare that. 
you know, it's always about people. And mm -hmm. it's always about the culture of the company. So you've got, you know, if you've got, a, uh, I live half the year in Austria and I remember going to Vienna to try to work with some people in some, some of the ministries in Vienna, the bureaucrats, mm -hmm. and they are more formal than formal. It's just, they, they were not at all interested in talking to a girl Mm -hmm. And they were particularly not interested in talking to an American girl who had a, a company. This is when I ran the opera company. Uh, and we had applied for some funding from the from the government. And navigating through that bureaucracy, you know, they say the French invented bureaucracy, but boy, the Viennese have their own mm -hmm. their own special version of it. <laughs> so Stepping forth as a woman and stepping up, I mean, it's always about politics. It's always about people. What has been use, what's been useful to you as you rise as a woman in a long established German company? Mm -hmm. um, and what do you wish was different? <laughs> what's definitely useful is to take the time at the beginning to get a good understanding of the connections in the company, who is like meeting with whom, like how decisions are being taken. Um, I think that's important because that helps later on to also be successful in driving the own business, driving transformation. And my experience is that it always like pays off to overinvest in this topic at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So when I started at Bosch, which is the large corporation we are talking about, I took like around six weeks to really meet with everybody. I already had a quite comprehensive onboarding calendar with about, I think, 30 meetings, 30 get to knows. And mm -hmm. I expanded it to double of it to ensure I really also get a bit broader in departments, in also like service functions to understand really who is doing what and who is also well connected with whom. Mm -hmm. um, that is something I think it pays off because it does not only tell you about what's visible from the structure, from the process, but even more important, what's not visible when it's getting clearer, what is also happening underneath like um, the surface. And I think that's something not to underestimate, then also takes the time for networking. For me, it's something I like. So uh, it's um, like a natural thing that I want to get to know the people and spend time with them. But I think that's also an important one, because as you said, it's about people and politics, but everything starts with people. And in order to move on, you need to build trust. And trust usually develops with time, uh, you have to interact with people six, seven times before you really get to a level where people can also understand the way you take, can predict what kind of like actions they have to also expect from you. And that's what I think is important because that makes things much easier also when there are questions to get support for a specific project or for budget approval. What is your specialty? What are you particularly good at? Well, I'm particularly good at transforming business on a large scale and in a systematic approach. So usually when I have like one area of responsibility, I want to approach it in a holistic way. Mm -hmm. So I took over the e-commerce channel, which was about sales and marketing in the first stage but it's impossible to develop a business uh, on a high-speed track and in a holistic way when not doing it together with logistics and finance and production. So I always um, go for the big approach, um, what I also experienced to be the most sustainable and uh, successful one in the short and the long run. What's successful in the short run? Please talk more about that. What's successful in the short run and in the long run? Are there two different things, two different approaches? It's 
the same approach, but I often see that it's not designed in a way that it can survive for a long run. In my perspective, to be successful in the short run, you can also like taking the example of being responsible for growing sales in an e-commerce channel. You mm -hmm. could do that very well with like restructuring the team in sales and marketing functions in a way that you're closer to the market and drive actions in increasing distribution, in increasing might be advertising spend to get more visibility, more sales. And then you can have like good results very fast, but it will naturally reach a growth barrier in traditional companies like ones that are now 50, 60 years or even longer on the market because usually the entire value chain is designed um, for a traditional way of doing business. What mm -hmm. means you have like a business that is more planable. So you have might be um, brick and mortar customers that order large. More, more, more planable. You mean a uh, business that where you've got a plan, you can plan ahead and you know, yes, exactly. you know, more predictable maybe. Yeah. And less yes. dynamic. While um, now business like e-commerce is very dynamic. You have the opportunity to scale business faster because usually order rhythms are shorter, but it also means you have to be more dynamic in all your processes because mm -hmm. it's not only about sales and marketing before you have to ensure that these volumes are produced, delivered on time and full. And then uh, you can like also explore the entire opportunities and then like even better you also know what to do with all the data you usually generate. So you mm -hmm. need smart AI to um, analyze the data, generate insights, and learn from it. And that means if you want to excel in the long run, you have to think um, on a larger scale and ensure that if you change the sales and marketing function for e-commerce, you change everything that's around as well. Because then you can like really go hand in hand, get your supply chain, your production, everything also as well on the new speed level. And that's for me the approach in the long run, because then you have made the entire organization fit for the future and you ensure that these growth barriers are not coming up. And that's what, what I think is especially nowadays, um, important where the speed of development in trade and marketing channels is quite high. These are ones convenience. The technology can more and more provide convenience. And by that, the complexity of channels is rising. Do you find, maybe this is something from 20 years ago, not just say mm -hmm. five years ago, do you find in an established manufacturing company, I mean, you sell products, do you find resistance from, from the engineers, from the people who are, who are involved in actually building the product uh, to, to your trying to move things forward and faster? Mm, I wouldn't call it resistance. I would call it more that the importance is often neglected. You have to see, <laughs> Elizabeth, in a typical um, engineering-driven company, the thinking in the past was that when you have great product who, like, that have great quality, usually they should be bought, right? Because it's great products and everybody like, who is aware of that as well would buy them. But nowadays, in the last, I would say, like probably 20 years, more and more marketing came up, more brands, more competition due to also a more global competitive environment. And by that, also marketing uh, became mm -hmm. more important because if you are like not the only brand on shelves or even like in e-commerce, not on page one, nobody will see you. So mm -hmm. there is a need to like get more visibility and change all the processes around. And like, if it's explained like that, I also see that it's like, it's recognized 
mm -hmm. it's also valued, but I think very often it's still not seen because um, when you are like focused um, on more the product, you mm -hmm. often don't have this direct response from the market because you just don't look at that that often. And yes. that's a big, big like also pitfall that's like visible in many companies still. But I see the value once it's also yeah more tangible to them is seen. Then it's more the question where to spend the money because nowadays it means that more budget has to go to marketing what ultimately means that there's less budget might be for product development um, mm -hmm. and the engineering. I remember very early in my opera career, those of us who was, when I was, you know, fourth assistant from the left at the San Francisco mm -hmm. Opera way back when, um, just starting out. And those of us who were working on stage and backstage in my department, there were 12 of us and we were squeezed into a little tiny room because the marketing department kept having more people and the fundraising department kept having more people. Um, opera companies in America are nonprofits. And so mm -hmm. people have to be spending a lot of time cultivating the donors. And I complained about that once where one of the fundraisers heard it and she turned around caught me at the end. We were both standing at the coffee pot. And she said, I am raising the money for your salary. And I, I said, I said, oh, I hadn't really thought of it that way. But yes, the work that she was doing was actually paying my salary. So I shut up after that. It was a very useful lesson. <laughs> when and I was 25 and I already knew everything. So um, as one does when one is 25. Fiona, you've spoken a little bit about the pace of change management mm -hmm. and managing the timing and the pace. Can you expand on that a little bit? What are your, your thoughts about pacing yourself and the rate of change? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very important question. Um, from my perspective, I think like what, what's important and um, where it's also relevant to use like sufficient time is to analyze the current situation. Change is very much about making it feel for the people that are involved that it's not like a change that is like put um, on top of them, but it's something developed together. And here, I think it's important to understand first if there is like a specific also target or new like status in mind to understand well where the majority of the team is right now and then develop a strategy together how this can be achieved like to understand first why we have to change, what we want to do and who is like doing what in this process and once this is defined and that like can take like some time my experience is it should be fast because the more time you um, have in this process the more like it starts not being a focus anymore especially at the beginning I've learned that it's good to create situations that you can feel also the positive impact of change. Mm -hmm. It happens very fast because usually people are not patient. They want to learn fast if they give energy into a process, mm -hmm. it pays back. So I can recommend to like have a quite like high drum beat at the beginning, ensure that there are like tangible positive also experiences that give um, a glimpse of how the new situation is paying back, um, how that feels to celebrate this, because then it's like much faster to be like in a situation where it becomes more natural to uh, might mm -hmm. be like act uh, in a new setup. Most recently, I like um, also implemented a new kind of agile working system, agile governance model. And then it's like becoming also more and more the case that people 
ask for it and might be also the ones that haven't been included in the first wave um, of transformation want to come in. And um, being like very close to that development and also as a leader, ensuring to um, like understand what is happening, who is already completely in like the new system, who might be needs uh, some support, who needs some also assistance to it is very important. And once it is more and more like becoming a natural behavior, it's also easier to step a bit more back and um, also increase uh, the time amount between um, check-in points and milestones. But my experience is if there's a very tight drumbeat the first three months, it's so much easier afterwards. While I saw change processes that have a very long time frame that over the entire process, there's again like coming up questions. Should we really do it like that? Shouldn't we like try out another approach without having tried mm -hmm. the one sufficiently? And that's from my perspective, the biggest like risk that such processes can also fail. Well, and that, how much time do you spend getting to consensus before actually taking action? It's always different and depending on the size of the organization and the like magnitude of change. But usually I would take around four to six weeks. Mm -hmm. Very often um, there is a need to change. And what I think is also important, change is nothing where like we start now and the project is over in three months. My perspective is that as a leader, you have to develop the organization, the teams into a kind of mindset toward change because it's a process. It's not like something that's completed at any point of time because everything is still like in a frequent change. And that means it has more to become like a habit of steady change and ideally once a year um, there's like a kind of um, rolling plan update where it's like about these four to six weeks where you see like what might be has to be adapted mm -hmm. what should be even like rolled out further because it worked out very well but that's more like my mental model that it sees this this kind of development towards change I know that you've done a, a TED style talk mm -hmm. where you were playing the drums and you're talking about the drum beat of, of change, of managing change. How does that fit in? Yeah, I'm playing the drums um, like now for about 20 years. So um, it's something that is very close uh, to my heart. And I see a lot of like parallels to the business world and specifically to um, change management. When like you look at a drum set, you see like the different toms and crashes and you see it's like basically a set out of 11, 12 um, like separate instruments. Mm -hmm want to call it like that and what I used the drum set for in my TED talk was um, to also compare the previous world um, with uh, today's world and you also said it um, earlier in this podcast that in the old world the main task of a manufacturing company was to sell sell mm -hmm. like the uh, great quality products to a well, and to produce great quality products and then sell them yes and because it was it was a well known brand people would of course buy that brand exactly so it's a very simple beat you mm -hmm. could play it like just like with one of uh, these instruments of the drum set and like a very steady beat so mm -hmm. that was what i also performed on stage but nowadays it's not sufficient because imagine now um, this still great quality product is sold like on shelf in like a store. Okay, people might see it and buy it. 
but then um, it's also online. If it's not on page one, but uh, on page four or five, nobody will ever see it because mm -hmm. nobody of us like clicks. Uh, like nobody goes to page two. No nope. page. Yeah. And then um, it's also like sold by influencers, and they even have one product they try from a category. So even there, if you're not visible, you're not seen. And then you might have the products um, visible, but your supply chain is not like um, dynamic enough to also serve now all of these channels. That means you have more channels, like more touch points in marketing and sales. And you have like also like more tasks within these channels you as a company has uh, have to fulfill. And that means the beat is much more complex. And that means like to use like uh, the drum set again, um, it was um, like, it was like a necessity to use all of these 11 instruments mm -hmm. and play a very dynamic beat. And what I wanted to highlight with that is that you can basically hear and feel how the world has changed from a very like let's say simple one to a very complex one from mm -hmm. the perspective of a company and what i like also wanted to um like um highlight with that is that change is like getting people into motion and mm -hmm. it's not all about like explaining the situation that there was a change in the world of trade um, it's also about feeling it because that ultimately gets people into motion. And if you talk about a beat, usually all like humans get into motion. They want to move, they want to dance if they hear music. So it's also a very nice trigger to um, start a kind of change process. What a wonderful metaphor. So Fiona, just this is this is so much fun, and I I love it that you added the drum set to your talk. Do you have a a metaphor where each drum is a different part, or each beat is a has an equivalent in business? Yes. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> yes, tell us. Actually, um, like every drum had like one function mm -hmm. um, of uh, the business and then there was also a different beat on it so for example um, like the bass drum um, was the sales function um, mm -hmm. very like steady beat because like you have to sell and it's powerful and it's like also driving things forward and um, like when you now imagine a drum set you use like um, your feet and you are like really pushing like the sails forward. So um, that was- It's also the, the foundation of everything. Like, yes. a, like, a, like a bass singer is the root of the chord. For yeah, exactly. Yes. And it's like also constant over like the entire beat um, in connection with every other like drum that mm -hmm. is coming afterwards. The Hyatt, for instance, uh, was the leader because they are the high hat the high hat yeah yes because there you have like very different styles as it is like in a leadership situation you have to use different styles um it will depend on if it's closed or if it's open you can also use your feet but you also can use both your drumsticks um so that's uh, also to orchestrate uh, all the other like drums uh, well uh, to ensure that they play like with uh, like one direction and mm -hmm. successfully together. Mm -hmm. Where's the symbol? <laughs> well, now it's getting a bit more tricky because um, I use a very rich drum set. Mm -hmm. So there has been four symbols. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Basically, there was as a distribution planning and logistic which mm -hmm. have been played in a connected way because you need both uh, to get the products in time and full to the customer mm -hmm. another uh, symbol was the business development and data engineers mm -hmm. 
because there you also like are able to like have all the zeros and ones uh, mm -hmm. to talk, like in the uh, IT language and you can like play that uh, in a very fast way there. And the last one was uh, business operations and back office because there you have to be on the point and then like you see like how you can play a drum, you can like play on it and then also use your hand uh, to stop it immediately. Mm -hmm. What an important uh, characteristic uh, in the back office uh, where you need often very like fast interventions. I love it. Oh, Fiona Lieberhans, thank you so much for being a guest. I, I, I love it that we got a chance to explore the metaphor of the drum set in business. Um, never had a guest do that before. So that's going to be really fun. Thank you so much for having been a guest here on Speakers Who Get Results. Thanks a lot. It was a big pleasure. Okay. So this has been Speakers Who Get Results. I'm Elizabeth Bachman, your host. If you enjoyed it, please tell your friends, subscribe to us, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and especially go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. That's the one that counts. And we hope you can see, you can come and pay attention to all the wonderful I guess I have, as well as Fiona Liebehens. This has been Speakers Who Get Results. I'll see you on the next one. We have just concluded another great episode of Speakers Who Get Results with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. If you got value from today's episode, please feel free to share us with your friends and colleagues. You may also visit elizabethbachman.com for additional resources. Be sure to tune in every week for new episodes. And thanks for tuning in.